I concluded our previous lecture with a provocative claim. I said that abolishing occupational licensing laws would improve consumer welfare. In this lecture, I'll explain the main reason I made that claim. First, remember that licenses tend to reduce the supply of workers in the licensed field. That reduction raises the wages of licensed workers. And as we saw last class, fewer people then make exchanges with them. So why do I think consumers would be better off if licensing laws were abolished? In short, because licensing laws reduce the number of mutually beneficial exchanges that people make. And a fundamental tenet of economics is that all voluntary exchanges are beneficial to both parties. But don't just take my word for it. Writing in 2001, the 1986 winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics, James Buchanan, states that, quote, the mutuality of advantage from voluntary exchange is the most fundamental of all understandings in economics. Along similar lines, the great uh, excuse me, 20th century economist Ludwig von Mises writes in his 1949 magnum opus, Human Action, quote, the exchange relation is the fundamental social relation. Interpersonal exchange of goods and services weaves the bond which unites men into society. The reason for economists' confidence that all exchange benefits both parties hinges on a single word that appeared in the Buchanan quote. It's the word voluntary. When an exchange is voluntary, neither party brings violence or the threat of violence to the negotiations. Both parties can go through with the trade or retain title to their property. They are free to choose. This implies that no one would make a voluntary exchange unless he believes that what he'll gain from exchanging is more valuable than what he'll give up, that is, his opportunity cost. When you shop at the grocery store, you may prefer having a bag of apples to having $5. Meanwhile, the store owner may prefer having the $5 to having the bag of apples. In other words, people don't value goods identically, and when these reverse valuations exist, both parties will be better off if they exchange. Likewise, when you work a job, you demonstrate that you value your paycheck more than whatever else you could be doing instead. Your pay at least covers your opportunity cost of working, and your employer values your labor services more than the money he pays you. Thus, trading makes the world a wealthier place because both parties gain, even though exchange only changes who owns what property titles. Often, exchange just moves stuff around. Even though the same amount of stuff exists before and after many exchanges, it still makes us richer. Pretty amazing. Of course, I don't deny the familiar phenomenon of buyer's remorse. You can come to rue an exchange afterward. The claim is only that before an exchange takes place, both parties anticipate they will benefit. If that weren't the case, one or both parties would refuse to interact. And since we're only considering voluntary exchanges, if even one of the buyers did not anticipate gain, nothing would happen. No exchange would occur. That's it. That's today's lesson. But the implications are far-reaching and sometimes very difficult to perceive without well-calibrated economic eyeglasses. That trade makes both parties better off is a seemingly commonsensical insight to some people. Yet, Throughout history, many others have devoted significant intellectual energy to denying the insight that voluntary exchange necessarily creates positive value for both parties. In many instances, the idea that exchange is mutually beneficial has eluded even the world's brightest minds. Aristotle, for instance, thought people exchanged when both parties valued the goods equally. In his understanding, exchange does not make people worse off, but it doesn't make them better off either. As we saw a moment ago, Aristotle's view is flawed because people exchange when they each believe they'll be made better off from trading. If not, then why exchange? Another tremendous intellect, medieval theologian Thomas Aquinas, believed that many voluntary exchanges were indeed mutually beneficial, but that not all were. 
Aquinas maintained that exchanges occurring at exceptionally high prices were nothing short of theft by sellers. According to his view, one party can benefit from a voluntary exchange while the other party loses. These and similar errors thrive even today. These errors provide the intellectual firepower for the idea that, that uh, individuals could be made better off were the government to restrict exchanges in certain instances. Historically, the most common argument for restricting some exchanges is that not all voluntary exchanges are mutually beneficial. Many thinkers, like Aquinas, as we just saw, have held that voluntary exchange benefits one party while harming the other one. This perspective on exchange sees trade as fundamentally zero-sum. One man's gain is another man's loss. In this view, the essence of exchange is exploitation. For this lecture, I'm using the word exploitation to refer to an interaction that leaves one party worse off than before the interaction. If you read the free online Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy's entry on exploitation, you'll see that this is a common use of the word, uh, although admittedly not the only use of the term. The view that voluntary exchange can be exploitative in this sense is expressed well by the 16th century French philosopher Michel de Montaigne. In one of his famous essays, originally published in 1580, Montaigne wrote that, quote, no profit whatever can possibly be made but at the expense of another. Montaigne elaborates on this comment by arguing that doctors exploit the fact that people become ill and that architects exploit the fact that our buildings continually crumble. Here's how the economist Ludwig von Mises responds to Montaigne. He writes in Human Action, quote, what produces a man's profit is not his fellow citizens' plight and distress. Now here comes the critical part of Mises' quote. But the fact that he alleviates or entirely removes what causes his fellow citizens' feeling of uneasiness. What hurts the sick is the plague, not the physician who treats the disease. The doctor's gain is not an outcome of the epidemics, but of the aid he gives to those affected. I think many people do accept Mises' argument for most exchanges. But what about hard cases that seem, at least on the surface, to be truly exploitative? This question is important because the error holding that exchange is exploitation provides support for public policies which harm the very people they're intended to help. Once again, we must look through the opportunity cost lens to see how even seemingly lopsided exchanges are also still mutually beneficial. Let's be concrete. What about people who live in the underdeveloped world, working jobs that pay low wages and offer poor conditions by Western standards? Can we really say that those individuals benefit from exchanging their labor with their employers? Or alternatively, are they exploited and thereby made worse off? And if these workers are exploited, could we make them better off by passing public policies that punish their employers for the exploitation? Could we benefit these workers, say, by banning imports of goods which are manufactured by low-wage workers in the underdeveloped world? To answer that policy question, we first need to examine whether these workers are exploited or whether they derive benefit from their work. To begin answering that question, let me be crystal clear about the sort of situation I have in mind here. I'm not referring to enterprises that used coerced or slave labor. Those situations are clearly tragic, truly exploitative, because the laborers are not voluntarily choosing their situation. I'm only referring to enterprises in the underdeveloped world that pay low wages, typically expect long hours, and usually provide rather poor working conditions. The key is that every employee in these enterprises is working of their own free initiative. There is no coercion involved in the cases I'm thinking of. Okay, so does the employer in these contexts benefit at the laborer's expense? Well, this is undoubtedly an exploitative ex exchange according to many commentators in the Western world. What does the opportunity cost lens suggest, however? It shows us that as long as the employees work voluntarily, these workers benefit from exchanging their labor for the low wages their employer is offering them. 
So how does exchanging one's labor for a low wage actually benefit workers in underdeveloped nations? In a nutshell, it's because low wage factory employment is superior to the relevant alternatives that confront these workers. You probably guessed it, but just so that we're on the same page, a relevant alternative is whatever I'd be doing if I wasn't doing the thing I'm doing now. Everyone has a relevant alternative, in other words. That definition out of the way, let's unpack the idea that low wage factory employment is superior to the relevant alternatives of millions of the world's poorest people. It's easy to confuse the notion of better off with well off. However, looking through the opportunity cost lens will fix this error. By the standards of the developed world, the workers we're discussing here are not well off. Even the relatively poor in developed countries live materially comfortable lives relative to someone working 12 hour days for $1 an hour, perhaps, six days a week in a Bangladeshi factory. But the economic theory of exchange only says that exchange makes people better off, not that it makes them instantaneously wealthy, solves all of their problems, or that it makes them well off in some objective sense. The fact that even a low wage factory worker is made better off from exchange suggests that this worker's relevant alternatives are not all that enticing. Texas Tech economist Benjamin Powell has done the empirical work to document those relevant alternatives in his 2014 book, Out of Poverty. Powell shows that in countries like Bangladesh, Cambodia, Haiti, Laos, and Vietnam, more than 40% of the population lives on less than just $2 a day. By contrast to that abysmal figure, Powell finds that the average factory worker in those countries earns $10 a day, terrible by Western standards, but significantly better than average wages in those countries. In light of these wage differences, it's easy to see why an employee benefits from a low paying factory job relative to the alternative of even lower paying jobs. But what about working conditions in these sorts of factories? After all, many concerns about labor in the underdeveloped world arise from the working conditions rather than the take home pay per se. Unsurprisingly, working conditions are also bad by Western standards. Hours are long and conditions are much more dangerous than they are in Western factories. But how do these conditions compare to the workers' relevant alternatives? After all, working in a Western factory may not be the workers' relevant alternative. So to answer this question, Powell and his co-author, economist J.R. Clark, surveyed Guatemalan textile factory employees about their working conditions. Powell and Clark ask employees if they'd be willing to trade some of their wages to improve some feature of their work environment. This is a helpful question because it would tell us whether the workers would voluntarily choose their conditions and also takes into account one of our key economic ideas that we saw in our second lecture, scarcity. Here's what Powell and Clark find. 95.7% of the employees in these textile factories say they wouldn't trade any income for safer conditions. Over 95% also say they wouldn't trade any income for more extended bathroom or lunch breaks. Importantly, for our question about relevant alternatives, Powell and Clark also find that most employees report that their textile manufacturing job is safer and pays higher wages than their prior job. An astonishing 100% of respondents report that their factory job offers more benefits than their previous job did. It's little wonder then that employees sign up for these sorts of jobs. It makes them better off rel relative to their relevant alternatives, which is not to say they're well off, only better off. If you find yourself reasoning, well, I'd never accept a position with those working conditions, so this must be exploitation then you can discover the error in your thinking by looking through the opportunity cost lens. What would you give up if you took this job? What's your opportunity cost? Your relevant alternative might be a high paying job in an air conditioned office, or it might be investing in your education by purchasing additional years of school. 
It could even be that you're sufficiently wealthy that you'd simply enjoy leisure time. But what is the relevant alternative for someone who takes a low-paying factory job in the underdeveloped world? The relevant alternative for that person is likely an even lower paying, an even more dangerous job, such as in agriculture or illicit work. People work factory jobs in the underdeveloped world because it's their least bad option of the bad options they face. Relevant alternatives pay less or are more dangerous or both. It makes little sense, therefore, to blame these employers for offering something better than anyone else is offering to these workers. Speaking personally for a moment, I've never offered these workers any wage, so I'm certainly not going to condemn a large company who offers them something, something above zero. Now, let's return to the policy question that motivated our discussion so far. Understanding that voluntary exchange is always mutually beneficial has essential policy implications if our goal is to benefit the least well-off on our planet. The most important implication is that we cannot make the least well-off better off by impeding their ability to exchange with employers, even low-paying ones. More generally, someone is in a bad situation because they have few alternatives. You can't improve their standing by removing one of their bad options, especially when that's the alternative they've selected. Doing so can have deadly consequences for those in the underdeveloped world. Therefore, the opportunity cost lens tells us that certain public policies aimed at helping workers in underdeveloped countries may actually harm those workers instead. Think back to what we discussed in the last lecture. Intentions don't guarantee outcomes. Let's get concrete again for a moment. Many developed nations have passed laws prohibiting the importation of items produced by factory workers in the world's poorest countries. Similarly, many private groups have organized grassroots boycotts of companies that are known for paying low wages and supplying poor working conditions. But both attempts to punish employers actually worsen the plight of the world's poorest people. These policies ultimately reduce, they dampen the demand for factory workers, which causes some of them to take a pay cut. Worse yet, others lose their jobs altogether and thus their primary income stream. Where do the newly unemployed workers end up? They end up in other sectors that offer lower pay and or more dangerous working conditions, such as in agriculture, as I mentioned, self-employment, or illegal activities. The bottom line is that poorly paid factory workers do benefit from their employment, even if that benefit is not as great as we'd ultimately like to see. Exchange is not exploitation. Now, the analysis I just gave is why even ideologically left-leaning economists, such as Paul Krugman, who we saw in our opening lecture, and Oxford economist Paul Collier, are on record opposing the sorts of policies which would punish large employers who pay low wages to impoverished workers in the underdeveloped world. At the risk of stating the obvious, Krugman and Collier's opposition to policies like an import ban isn't because they're in love with large multinational corporations. It's because they believe these policies will cause harm to the world's poorest people. At this point, you might have many other questions. You might be wondering why workers in the underdeveloped world don't command higher wages, or why large manufacturing companies can't simply pay their poor workers even more than they do. Those are great questions, and economics does have answers for them. But they're also beyond the scope of this short course. That said, I do want to leave this discussion on an optimistic note. One piece of great news is that economic development eventually eliminates low-paying and dangerous manufacturing work. Wherever economic development occurs, workers' wages and working conditions swiftly rise until they become comparable to those in the wealthiest nations. And as Powell has shown, the process by which development is occurring appears to be speeding up globally for those of us who care about the welfare of the least of these, to use that great biblical expression, that's something to celebrate. In the meantime, let's not get in the way of that development process by passing laws that unintentionally harm the world's poorest people. Let's take a look at another example that people raise as an exception to the argument that exchange is always mutually beneficial. This one's less emotionally charged than my previous example, 
but I think it might be even more commonly held. What about middlemen? People exchange with middlemen, such as stockbrokers, real estate agents, wholesalers, and even romantic matchmakers, all the time. But precisely what service do these middlemen provide? Are they just leeches? It certainly doesn't seem like they're producing anything from a physical standpoint. Are they merely exploiting us? An exception to our principle that exchange makes both parties better off? Once again, many people think so. Here's what Frederick Bastiat says about middlemen in the very same essay that gave us the broken window story that we saw in our first lesson. Some are vehement in their attack on those they call middlemen, accusing middlemen of interposing themselves between producer and consumer in order to fleece them both without giving them anything of value. What's Bastiat saying here? He's simply explaining many people's intuition. Their instinct suggests that middlemen have devised a way of rudely inserting themselves into transactions where they have no legitimate business in order to exploit the other parties that are exchanging. Indeed, many people believe that middlemen live at the expense of their exchange partners, all while providing no value to them in return, that they're simply parasites on otherwise value-creating interactions. I remember a lunch hour at my first job after college, where a coworker passionately held forth on how banks, real estate agents, and other middlemen create no value. To see what service the middleman is providing, we must put on our economic eyeglasses. Notice that part of making a successful exchange means searching for and identifying an exchange partner. Our exchange partners don't just fall from the heavens like manna. It might seem obvious, but failure to grapple with this fact lurks behind the middleman as exploiter error. And our search for exchange partners it consumes real resources, such as our time. In other words, searching for exchange partners comes with an opportunity cost. Middlemen reduce these costs by collecting knowledge about who would like to buy, who would like to sell, and at what prices. By providing this service, middlemen lower the total costs that exchange partners bear, even when the middleman has the gall to demand compensation for the services he's rendered. All said and done, people still anticipate gain from using a middleman compared to their relevant alternative of going it alone, hence their willingness to exchange with them. You can make this more concrete by considering the following scenario. Imagine a college student who owns shares of Apple stock that he wishes to sell. Without middlemen, in this case stockbrokers, who specialize in bringing stock buyers together with stock sellers, he'd be stuck knocking on dorm rooms until he found a buyer Think about the opportunity cost of his time, and what are the odds that he'd find the buyer willing to pay them the highest price for the stock? Probably pretty low. In the end, the college student benefits from exchanging with a middleman stockbroker. We can apply the same reasoning to middlemen in every other context. Our logic explains, for example, why homes sell faster when a real estate agent is working the case. Thus, it simply doesn't make sense to mindlessly repeat the mantra about cutting out the middleman. Well, in today's lesson, we learned that the root of the exploitation fallacy is a failure to consider the relevant alternatives exchanging parties face. Implicitly, a person arguing that exchange is exploitation is saying something like the following. Suppose a person isn't sick. Suppose a laborer doesn't live in a poor country. And suppose the college student already knows who wants to pay the highest price for his stock. Sure, if those things were true, then it's hard to see how the exchanges discussed today would be anything short of exploitation. But in our world, the real world, people do get sick. They do live in underdeveloped countries, and they are ignorant of potential exchange partners. Remember that quote from Mises at the beginning of this lecture, the fact that we live in this veil of tears means that we do benefit from exchanging with doctors who rescue us from sickness. Workers in the underdeveloped world do benefit from exchanging their labor with large corporations who rescue the worker from a worse fate and lessen the worker's poverty in the process, even if they don't eliminate it. And we do benefit from exchanging with stockbrokers who rescue us from our ignorance of exchange opportunities. Arguments against voluntary exchange come from a fantasy world, not from the real world where people face concrete trade-offs. 
Today, we focus on a simple yet often misunderstood lesson. It's this. If exchange is voluntary, it's not exploitation. It makes both parties better off, everywhere and always. In the next lecture, we'll address another challenge posed to the idea that free exchange benefits society's members. This objection questions whether the basic principles of exchange that we learn today hold when we start drawing political boundaries on the map. It's to those doubts which we'll turn in our next lecture.